Hi everyone, welcome to today's talk uh, by Aaron Benlav with a slightly alternative title. It's um, Aaron's going to be speaking about automation, the end of work and a new tomorrow. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to briefly draw attention to the fact that there's a major strike underway by workers in higher education in the UK who are part of the UCU, the University Colleges Union. Uh, these strikes have been prompted by the refusal of university employers to withdraw or compromise on significant cuts to pension schemes. The strike action is also about pay cuts, inequality and over-reliance on insecure pay contracts. Staff are also engaging in action short of a strike and uh, this has prompted retaliation by employer representatives who have authorised managers to implement pay cuts with several universities threatening to implement these cuts up to 100%. Um, ULUP being based in France and employed under French labour law, we are not members of the UCU, but I wanted to open with this message of support and solidarity and remind people that, you know, if you'd like to know more about this, you can visit the UCU website, that's ucu.org.uk, and they've also got information about strike funds that you can contribute to if you want to support um, striking workers. Okay, back to today's talk then, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Aaron Benenov. Um, and this talk is part of a series at ULA we've been running for a while, titled Theory and Crisis. Um, Aaron's writings were quite influential, really, on the entire framing of this series. His academic articles over the past decade, as well as his writings with the EndNotes Collective, have given some of the most compelling and insightful theorizations of contemporary capitalist crisis, producing novel insights on some of the most challenging contradictions of the contemporary world. For example, how is it that more people than ever are compelled to sell their labor to survive, while at the same time, there's a decline in the demand for labor? How is it that historically high rates of proletarianization have gone hand in hand with the rejection of more and more people from formal labor markets? Through a reactivation of the Marxian thesis and surplus populations, as well as an engagement with a wide range of academic or of economic theory, excuse me, Aaron's work um, in EndNotes and in academic publications such as uh, social science history, um, provides helpful answers to these questions. His work also considers how these developments change your understanding of how class relates to work and how class struggle takes unfamiliar forms in times of crisis. So in this sense, his work has been very conscious of a central question in this series, which has to be asking how theory situates itself in relationship to existing social and political movements. He's perhaps most well known for his book, Automation and the Future, recently published by Verso, and which builds upon a series of articles for the New Left Review. Here he develops the arguments that the decline in the demand for labor of past decades was due not to an unprecedented leap in technological innovation, as theorists of automation tend to claim, but was rather due to ongoing technical change in an environment of deep in economic stagnation. While challenging the automation theorists by offering a more rigorous explanation for current economic decline, he takes seriously the utopian desires and visions animating their work. So in this sense, the book ends with a provocative set of propositions for what a post-scarcity society might entail and what sort of transformations would need to take place. And that's been the premise of his more recent work on post-scarcity economics. So um, just briefly then about Aaron, he's a currently a postdoctoral researcher at Humboldt University Berlin and in fall 2022 he will begin a position as assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Syracuse University. Uh, before I hand you over to Aaron just a, a quick reminder that we've got a Q&A session at the end so Aaron will be there to take questions about the talk and um, so don't hesitate to use the chat box during the talk if you want to any, enter any questions we'll read them uh, out at the end. So I'll hand you over to Aaron. Thanks very much. Great, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. I'm just gonna share my um, slides now. So uh, I'll just note that I was intending to give a talk that's more about the ongoing project I'm doing about post-scarcity economics. Um, but I felt like I wasn't totally ready for prime time with that. So I'm giving a talk that sort of bridges some of the work I did on automation and some of the work I'm doing 
on post scarcity. And I'm hoping that um, maybe with the questions and discussion uh, that will help me kind of firm up a little bit more what I wanna say uh, in the next book. So the talk today is titled uh, Automation, the End of Work and a New Tomorrow, question mark. Um, and the, the background for the talk is, as Eugene mentioned, the rise of this automation discourse that I was responding to in my first book. So uh, automation theorists claim that we're living in an age of accelerating technological change, which will bring about the end of work as we know it. And one thing that's really interesting about this group is that they really come from across the political spectrum and from a range of different disciplines. We have, you know, academics, economists uh, promoting these ideas. We have, you know, futurists and kind of people closer to Silicon Valley. And of course, maybe most famously, um, uh, just a few years ago, Andrew Yang was kind of promoting this idea of the automation discourse uh, in his effort to become the, the Democratic nominee for president. So what I see across this kind of wide ranging discourse um, is four core propositions that I'm going to outline for you now. The first proposition that they, and they all I think share these core ideas. Um, the four propositions are one, look around you, workers are already being displaced by ever more advanced machines. So this is an already present reality that we can directly point to in our experience. Two, this displacement is a sign that we're on the verge of achieving a largely or fully automated society. Usually the time frame is unclear, but it's within our lifetimes we're passing over into this new world. Three, automation should entail our liberation from toil, but since most people have to work in order to live, it could be a nightmare. And it's with this proposition that the automation theorists really set themselves aside from people I refer to as techno-optimists who think that nothing really has to change uh, in order to get to the beautiful world of tomorrow. Um, for the automation theorists, by contrast, we're faced with this stark choice uh, because, of the, because of the social institutions we now possess. And then fourth, they say, the only way to prevent a nightmare of mass unemployment is to implement a universal basic income and to transition then to a post-scarcity world. Now, I wanna focus a little bit on this idea of post-scarcity through automation because it helps frame some of what I'm going to talk about uh, later on. Um, these ideas that, uh, about a world that we're going to be able to achieve in which um, uh, there's simply no more work to do, um, you know, it, it has an interesting history that goes back into, you know, sci-fi for many decades. Um, and it, it seems to have at its kind of core um, this notion that we are very close to achieving technologies that on the one hand are going to produce something like fully automated luxury communism, which of course became a meme on the internet and spread rapidly before Aaron Bastani actually published a book with that title. Um, but by fully automated luxury communism, I take it to mean a kind of world in which um, we have a limitless capacity to produce things. And that means a world in which really no one goes hungry anymore. No one has to worry about um, whether they're going to survive. Uh, and also, especially, um, no one, of course, is going to have to work. It's a world free of work and of work-based identity as much as of uh, need and want. Um, and then a second kind of piece of that argument, which I think is less developed in the fully automated luxury communism vision and more in texts like, uh, you know, the People's Republic of Walmart is this idea of artificial intelligence digital planning. So it's not just that we will have the production capacity to produce whatever we want, but also that um, we'll have intelligent enough machines and computers that they will be able to take information. Maybe we won't even have to supply this information um, and we will be able to uh, use it to kind of effortlessly bring into the world all of the things that we might need to survive. And, you know, thinking about this in more detail, like when you read the science fiction about it, you really come to think of a world of uh, new pleasures and new possibilities for human enjoyment. There's often a question in the texts around post-scarcity around like, how people will make meaning in their lives and whether what kinds of opportunities there will be to, for people to feel a sense of purpose in a world where machines are kind of able to do everything we can do, um, but better. 
But you know, this, this idea of post-scarcity that comes out of this uh, technological overcoming perspective is something that I'm thinking about a lot in the future work, and I'll come back to it at the end of the talk. So when we think about whether this is actually happening or not, um, we usually point, the, the automation theorists point to uh, a few trends. The first is advanced industrial robotics. So you see depicted here the, um, the old uh, Tesla production plant in Fremont, California, and you have just like one worker surrounded by uh, all of these machines, these robotic arms that are automatically producing or at least assembling um, cars. In addition to this kind of advanced industrial robotics, we're also pointed to machine learning, neural networks, uh, the arrival at least of forms of narrow artificial intelligence, not yet to artificial general intelligence, but we're told sometimes that it's coming soon, though its horizon is unclear. So these are anyway the technological trends that people are pointing to. And then alongside those, they point to a set of uh, economic trends that are very worrying. Um, this graph, we'd have to update it. It's actually quite different what's going on in the gigantic uh, recession today. But in the United States, uh, at least since the early 1980s, we've seen a pattern of jobless recovery. Um, what does jobless recovery actually mean? It means that it's taken longer and longer for uh, the labor market to recover from a recession. It, there was a peak level of employment before the recession starts and then, un, then employment dips during the recession. How long does it take to recover to its pre-recession peak? And what you see in this graph is that in the early 80s recession and the early 90s and the 2000s and after the great financial crisis, it took longer and longer for the labor market to rec recover. But this graph only shows you unemployment, which is only one part of a broader issue that I describe in the book as a decline in the demand for labor or persistently low demand for labor. The other side of this unemployment is underemployment and rising inequality. So here as further evidence for these trends, um, you see this, this graph, which, which is famously uh, um, shown for the United States, depicting this very wide divergence between the growth of wages and the growth of productivity levels. What I'm showing you here are um, wage productivity gaps for the entire OECD, so for all of the rich countries combined. Uh, the dotted line in the middle is average wages, the, the kind of lower gray line is median wages, which is more representative of like what the middle worker, you know, it's another sense of what average is, but you see, especially between the top and the bottom line, this really widening uh, divergence between the wages people earn and the productivity of their labor. And this is a very disturbing trend, even from the perspective of mainstream economists. So, uh, and of course, as a, as a final kind of um, uh, uh, push in the direction of evidence for this automation theory, there's of course this kind of new, um, you know, battle of giants, the new kind of uh, gilded age uh, war between figures like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos to uh, win space. Uh, you know, obviously Mark Zuckerberg falling behind on this, hoping that we will all um, don helmets and not worry about getting to space and just imagine that we can be there uh, in virtual reality. But, you know, these big contenders of uh, Musk and Bezos suggesting a kind of world in which these ultra billionaires are much more concerned about escaping the planet entirely than uh, dealing with the, you know, huge problems uh, here on Earth. So the question that I ask in my work is, you know, what really is the relationship between the technological innovations like advanced robotics and artificial intelligence and these labor market trends and, of course, broader social inequality trends, how are they connected? In other words, is automation responsible for the growing difficulty that workers face in finding and uh, holding on to jobs? So here I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the evidence from my book and then point a little bit towards the kind of future work that I'm doing. That's also in the last chapter of my book on post-scarcity economics. So um, the point that I make, and I try to make this as strongly as possible over and over again and in different ways, is that if automation theorists were right, 
then the labor, labor productivity would be growing at a rapid pace. And people often misunderstand exactly what that term means, labor productivity, because you might think, okay, if we live in a world where robots are increasingly replacing humans, then it's the robots that are becoming more productive. The human beings, they're not necessarily becoming more productive. We're precisely replacing people with robots. But that's a misunderstanding of what this term labor productivity measures. Labor productivity is just a measure of output per hour worked. It's just, you know, you take total output and you divide it by total number of hours or total number of workers. And so this measure, actually, if workers were being thrown out of production, so there were fewer and fewer workers, that would show up in this type of statistics as higher and higher labor productivity. So even though it's not the workers themselves, but the robots doing the work, you should still be able to see that. And contrary to what uh, the automation theorists have been saying, this is a really impressive mistake. Um, it, it, even Paul Krugman was pointing it out during uh, Andrew Yang's presidential um, nomination run. This is uh, labor productivity for the manufacturing sector in the United States. This is just you know, the level of manufacturing productivity. And what you can see is that in this era, in the United States, when people were talking, this is really the, the last 10 years of like discourse about automation saw flatlining and even declining productivity growth in the manufacturing sector. So instead of this incredible takeoff, we had total stagnation in manufacturing. And it's not just in the manufacturing sector that this is going on, actually across the entire economy. And I've highlighted for you here, three countries, the United States, Germany, and Japan, that are really at the forefront of, um, of industrial robotics and of robotics generally. These are really the leaders in um, robotics. Maybe we could add South Korea to the mix to have an even fuller picture and a few other countries in, in Western Europe like Sweden. But what you see in general here for the economy as a whole highlighted in those red boxes is a really stark decline in rates of productivity growth across these economies. In the US, productivity is growing at half the pace it did during the post-war boom. And in Germany and Japan, it's less than a fifth of its uh, earlier pace. So this is an extreme decline in productivity growth. Whatever trends are there, there are uh, towards automation, certainly automation is happening in some lines, but it's being overwhelmed by trends that are leading to even lower productivity growth over time. Um, and corresponding to that, uh, I point out, you know, the hidden trend that the automation theorists have been missing, which is that alongside this decline in, um, in productivity growth, there's actually been an even more significant or at least a significant decline in rates of GDP growth. So this is just the growth rate of the economy as a whole in the US, Germany, and Japan. What we see is a really dramatic and sharp fall off in uh, rates of growth for the economy. Why does that matter? Well, what it indicates to us is that it's not that rates of job destruction are accelerating. That's kind of the story that we're being told through this discourse on automation, that there's a speed up in job destruction. In fact, the rate of job destruction, as indicated crudely by the rate of labor productivity growth, is decelerating. We're destroying fewer jobs than before. And we see that in all different kinds of measures. People are getting stuck in jobs uh, for a very long time. Rates of job churn, like the, 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 the speed at which people are changing jobs is actually lower. It's that people are getting stuck where they are. So job destruction is slowing down. It's rather that the pace of job creation is slowing down. That's the real problem. It's that jobs aren't being created as quickly as they were before. Not that jobs are being destroyed more quickly than they were in the past. Um, and the reason for this that I highlight in the book, uh, and I draw here on, on a Marxist economist, Robert Brenner, but it's increasingly been recognized and given a number of different explanations by mainstream economists, is this phenomenon uh, called secular stagnation. And here I'm showing this to you, um, again, for the Club of Rich Countries, the OECD, um, which still accounts for a huge portion, more than the majority of uh, the total world economy. Um, what we see is this really sharp drop off in uh, average growth rates from around 5% per year in the early 60s down to about 1.5% per year in the last decade. Uh, and that trend line I've drawn for you there doesn't even include the really sharp um, Corona uh, recession of 2020, 2021, 
But um, you can kind of see there how even the, the dips, even the downturns are getting deeper and deeper uh, over time. So why is this happening? Why, why is there this uh, secular stagnation driven decline in the rate of job creation? Uh, why is that the real explanation for, um, uh, uh, for, for the problems with labor demand uh, rather than the pure technology story? I'm just gonna give you a little indication of what I say here and a much fuller explanation in the book. And of course, it also has many different components. And in the book, I focus on one in particular, and I'd be happy to talk about alternative explanations and so on in the Q&A if you're interested in that. But what I focus on in the book is this global shift um, where uh, over time, you know, we have this famous trend of globalization, rising share of exports, such as a proxy for just trade in the economy from basically the 1950s, actually. This graph only goes back to the 1970s, but there's this incredible increase, the second great globalization uh, in trade as a share of GDP from, from yeah, the 1950s to the 2010s, and then it kind of stabilizes at a high level. And what economists said is that this globalization was going to generate incredible gains from trade. Everyone was going to benefit from trade, and that would indicate, you would think, a growth in uh, you know, uh, an acceleration of growth rates around the world with globalization. That was the narrative that we were told. But the standard statistics of what actually happened, and this comes from the World Trade Organization, so certainly no kind of you know, uh, pessimist about the global trends. Um, what you see here represented in this graph are the growth rates of global agricultural and manufacturing production. Why are those the ones we focus on? Well, even as the economy has become more service-based, and I'll say something about that a little later, it's still the case that the vast super majority, 95% or so of global trade is in goods, not services. And what we see happening uh, across the whole world is a dramatic decline in growth rates, especially of manufactured goods over this period. So instead of generating, um, uh, trade complementarities, globalization actually generated trade redundancies. Uh, and, and I argue that as productive capacities expanded rapidly worldwide in the post-war era, the result was contrary to expectations, growing industrial overcapacity, and that drove down rates of investment. So basically companies were finding that the markets for their goods were ever more oversupplied. They were facing ever heightened competition and pressure on prices. And they responded to that by investing less in expanding their capacity to produce. And that's what generated the slowdown. It's actually a pretty straightforward and in a way mechanical story. But as it plays out, <clears throat> excuse me, across the world, the effects are truly dramatic. So what you see depicted here, <clears throat> excuse me, are global waves of deindustrialization and presented in kind of stylized form across the world, starting with you know, the most advanced countries in Northern Europe and the United States and North America, like the US and UK, followed by countries like Italy and then South Korea and you know, the growing, uh, uh, fast growing East Asian economies. What's surprising to people when I present this material is that often they say, oh, the reason for deindustrialization is that jobs are moving from the high income countries to low income countries. But what you see here represented in this graph by Brazil and South Africa is that actually uh, poorer countries, low and middle income countries have been seeing what economists sometimes call premature deindustrialization. They've also been deindustrializing. If countries in you know, the global north started deindustrializing around 1973, let's say, uh, in the global south, many countries, many, many countries throughout Latin America, the Middle East, Southern Africa, and um, East Asia started to deindustrialize around 1985. So just 12 years later, we start to see this as a global trend. And you might think, oh, well, this is just because in the end, all of these jobs move to China uh, and maybe India. Um, but here, what you see in this graph, and this is just the standard international statistics, tells a different story. Actually, China um, experienced its own really massive wave of deindustrialization in the mid-1990s, 
tens of millions of jobs were lost in China as the government switched to a program of what they called reform with losers. So they reduced support for state-owned enterprises. And there was a massive uh, rusting of the, um, the, the industrial belt in Northeast China. It's only in the early 2000s that the growth of jobs in Southern China and Southeast China and the Pearl River Delta starts to uh, uh, accelerate. And then you see China reindustrialize, but that reindustrialization period really only lasts about 10 years. And starting around 2013, China also begins to deindustrialize. And now, according to um, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, the entire world has been deindustrializing for about um, uh, uh, the past decade. So this is a really important global trend because industry in general has been the main engine of growth for the world economy for centuries. And um, what we're seeing happen is that, you know, this globalization trend of the past 50 years initially generated a massive boost to industrial growth across the world in the 50s and 60s and 70s, not only in the West, but really worldwide. Uh, the issue is that this really rapid acceleration in the growth of industrial capacity hit its limits as uh, we started to see overcrowded markets and uh, heightened competition, uh, you know, price declines and pressure on profits leading to the slowdown in investment. People are not going to build new capacity as quickly when they can't make good returns on the capacity they already have. Now, why is this so important? It's really important because nothing has replaced industry as an engine of growth, and especially not the service sector. Um, and this is really a key to the story that I'm telling and a big problem I'm pointing out with the automation story. Um, we hear a lot about a transition from an industrial to a service-based economy, but what people don't say when they talk about that is that this transition has been associated with a productivity growth slowdown, first of all, an economic growth slowdown relatedly, and third, a persistently low demand for labor. And uh, again, you know, these are the main trends. It's, it's associated with something that we could talk about if you want, called Balmo's cost disease, which is a tendency, it's not a law, but it's a tendency for uh, service sector activities to just be less amenable to incremental and constant productivity growth compared to industrial uh, production. And the latest wave of automation is actually just the latest wave of people saying, oh, this trend is going to be overcome or it's already being overcome. And again and again, uh, economists proclaiming this beautiful future of rapid productivity growth around the corner have been proven wrong by the empirical details. So the result of all of this has been uh, persistently low rates of economic growth, high rates of un and underemployment, and more job and income insecurity. Meanwhile, I think, um, and this is increasingly recognized by uh, engineers, that machine learning and neural networks are unlikely to produce a breakthrough to artificial general intelligence. That would be the, the saving, the, you know, like coup of the, of the automation theorist if it were coming true. But um, except for Silicon Valley boosters, who of course have a lot to gain from saying that AI general AI is around the corner, um, most people say that it's gonna be at least 100 years, you know, maybe 50 years or something. But you know, when, when engineers say that, they, they really just mean, we have no idea how to get there. Nothing we're doing right now is leading to this outcome. So how does this way of um, conceptualizing the problem uh, affect how we think about solutions? And this is again, pointing a little bit towards what I'm working on in my next book. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, one thing that's common across all of these different um, automation perspectives is this idea that what we need to promote as a solution is universal basic income. And I mentioned in the book, I think it's not very well understood, but I really want it to be better understood and thought about. This isn't a matter of guilt by association, but it's just a really important part of what's going on today that I think people are underestimating um, is that basic income is being promoted very heavily also by figures on the right. And one of the most important theorists of, um, of basic income, not important because he's great, but uh, important because he's very widely read and his proposals have made a big splash with a lot of people who are in favor of basic income is Charles Murray, who's famous for having written 
uh, the bell curve, you know, maybe the most infamous kind of uh, quack, fake science, uh, social science, uh, racist tract in many decades. So Charles Murray of bell curve infamy has been one of the biggest supporters of basic income. And then, of course, you have supporters with much less uh, onerous politics from, say, the center left, like Philippe von Paris, and from uh, the far left, like uh, Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams, whose book, uh, Inventing the Future, was such a big, uh, had a big impact on me, partially because I wanted to say a lot of it was wrong, but I, I really loved the book a lot and had a big influence over the talk. Anyway, so um, the point is that if these automation theorists were right, if they were right, then the main issue society would confront would be one of distribution. What I mean by that is that, you know, if the automation story were true, what would be happening? We would have machines and computers producing an incredible rate of growth for the economy, or at least potentially so. Like there would be almost limitless potential to produce whatever we want to need. The only problem would be that people couldn't afford this stuff. So what would, it would be a distributional problem. The question would be, how do we put money in people's hands so they can buy all the stuff that these machines and computers are producing? My argument on the contrary is that the problem we face is one of the organization of production. It's a production side problem. Actually, the economy is slowing down. Uh, it's not generating rapid growth. And we live in a society where um, people depend on that rapid growth in order to experience basic security. It's also what creates the, the revenue for the state from which the welfare uh, programs are funded and so on. So we have a problem in the engine itself of growth, the production engine, not merely a problem of distribution. And corresponding to that, why that's really important for UBI is that what we've seen in the course of um, this entire period, and I've been referencing this in different ways, is the threat of disinvestment. Sometimes, you know, Marxists used to speak about the capital strike, the idea that uh, in the moment where change is really possible, people think about like the strike in, in Chile in 1972 uh, against Allende's reforms. You know, there's this moment where capital says, you know what, we're not investing anymore. We're just going to actively throw the economy into chaos to show our dissatisfaction to try to prevent uh, anti-capitalist reforms from being implemented. I take that concept and I kind of broaden it out to a more general threat of disinvestment, which doesn't have to be a, like a, a, an event. It can also be a trend. And so what you see depicted here, this is the growth of the capital stock um, in the United States. It's, the, it's kind of the, you know, what, what Marx would have called the rate of capital accumulation. Um, or it's, or it's, the, it's the, the stock that corresponds to that flow. It's the, the total amount of capital that's accreting over time. And, um, oh, actually, no, this is its rate of growth. So this is the rate of capital accumulation. And what you see is a drop off over time and then a really significant drop off in the last 20 or so years in the rate of capital accumulation in the US. And this is reproduced in countries like Japan and Germany. What you see here is that capitalists are basically holding their wealth in financial forms. They're not investing it in the expansion of productive capacity. And that ultimately is what causes the economy to grow. By threatening not to invest, they're able to hold society hostage and say, you know, we think there's a bad business investment, uh, investment climate here. We're not gonna invest unless things change. And so that has had an incredible effect in terms of reducing the space of possible political change in uh, societies for 50 years. And of course, as is well known, in, in an effort to revive increasingly stagnant economies, governments have spent 50 years imposing austerity. And we saw the terrible effects of that during the corona crisis in societies, especially like France that had just kind of like, um, you know, massively disinvested from the public health infrastructure for many, many years before the crisis hit. Um, governments have too engaged in removing labor protections, so they're just encouraging workers to take whatever jobs are available by removing their protections, um, especially protections around youth uh, uh, workers to kind of force them to take jobs, whatever is available, even if they're low paying, even if they don't offer permanent contracts and so on. 
And contrary to the way people usually talk about neoliberalism, states have also accumulated massive debts. Um, people often say that the 50s and 60s, they're really wrong about the 50s anyway, but they sometimes say the 60s are the era of high Keynesianism. And in certain ways, that's true, but it's important to know that um, in general, in the 60s, governments were paying down their debts. They were not taking on debt to try to support the economy. Whereas from the, um, from the 1970s onward, governments have taken on more and more debt to try to stimulate private investment. And um, it's generated less and less uh, growth over time. So the question that we face as a society when we think not just about um, you know, questions like basic income, which from the perspective of uh, the society we live in is just another welfare program. And as a result, it faces in a, in a slow growing economy, it faces just as much pressure as other welfare programs uh, for austerity and cuts. And it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens in the next few years as the kind of initial wave of enthusiasm for um, big public spending projects perhaps declines. Uh, but in general, um, what this kind of points us toward is the need not only to think about how are we going to give people the kind of means of acquiring what they need to live by giving them, say, money, but it's this bigger question of how we render this threat of disinvestment inoperative. How do we kind of uh, stop, you know, the wealthiest individuals, corporate you know, managers and financial institutions, how do we stop them from having the stranglehold over the economy? We have to dramatically change, not just um, how people gain access to what they need to live, but the dynamics of our society, what determines the flows of investment, which in the end determine uh, what kinds of resources we have available for meeting which needs. And I can talk about that in more detail, but I think this investment question is a lot more important than, um, you know, non-Keynesians, for example, Marxists uh, have, have um, been able to think about thus far. So in the book, you know, after saying all of these kind of negative things about the automation discourse, I kind of return to its utopian kernel. And I say, actually, there's something here that we want to preserve and actually fight for which is the vision that I kind of dwelled on a little bit at the start of my talk of what comes after capitalism and what this better world is that we could be aiming at. The part of the tradition that I really, the, sorry, the part of the automation story that I really like is this idea that we could get to a world where um, people no longer have to worry about their survival, a world where you know, people are freed from worry about making a living and they're able to kind of face their life in this open way, not in terms of like, how am I gonna survive, but rather how am I gonna use the time that I have available to me to kind of do either what I want, you know, to live a life of pleasure or to do something meaningful and to kind of, you know, pleasure also has meaning, but like to think about uh, what kind of meaning they can bring to their life. And here I draw extensively on a tradition. I made it up in a way. I call it the post-scarcity tradition. And for me, it's a, it's a range of thinkers going back 500 years, all the way back to Thomas More, who thought it was possible to achieve a lot of what the automation theorists are talking about, but without automation. And of course, that means they're not imagining a world without work, but they're imagining a world with a substantial reduction in work. And I'll just give you, um, you know, two quotes that I like from this tradition. The first one goes all the way back to Thomas More, who, uh, when speaking of utopia, by the way, utopia, you know, there's a lot of problems with the society he described. Obviously, it's got slaves even. Um, when Marx and Capital talks about slave, the, you know, the kind of wage labor having this golden chain around them, that's from Thomas More's Utopia. That's how the slaves are adorned in utopia. So I'm not saying we should be utopians, but it was a first breakout text when Moore was experiencing the enclosures and thinking about nascent capitalism and imagining how to get beyond it. I think he had a major influence over the traditions that followed. So Moore said about utopia, no one is a pauper or beggar there. And though no one has anything, all are rich. For what greater wealth can there be uh, than to be completely spared any anxiety and to live with a joyful and tranquil frame of mind with no worries about making a living. And that idea that, you know, what post-scarcity is really about is this tranqu tranquil frame of mind, the freedom to think about one's life. Uh, there's a lot of studies in contemporary psychology that really draw on this idea 
about scarcity uh, rather than the economic one and develop it. Just one other quote to kind of pique your interest to think about this is from um, a figure who is an incredible thinker actually, uh, later became a Marxist, but spent a lot of time as a kind of non-Marxist person on the left, uh, W.B. Du Bois, who in one of his books, Dark Water, my favorite of his books, he said about the future, with work for all and all at work, probably from three to six hours would suffice and leave abundant time for leisure, exercise, study, and avocations. Who shall be artists and who shall be servants in this world to come? Or shall we all be artists and all serve? And you see there in Du Bois, this echo of an idea that goes all the way back to Thomas More, that the solution to our problems is not going to be found through uh, imagining technologies that abolish work entirely, but rather through a substantial reduction and sharing of work, and then the free provision of the kinds of goods and services that people need to survive. That's the crucial idea. And the question is how, uh, sorry, how we update that idea for the 21st century. Um, you know, when Moore was around, uh, you know, and as he came to influence the socialist tradition, the basic idea was that we um, abolish capital as a class, we uh, reduce and redistribute work, we engage in free giving to, um, you know, allow people to get what they need to survive. And that opens up for Moore and for his followers into the socialist and communist traditions a kind of double freedom of a new kind. You know, you think of Marx's double freedom as um, uh, total dispossession and freedom to sell your labor. Kind of post-scarcity vision of the double freedom is um, freedom from worry about survival because now you have access to what you need to live. And this other freedom of free time, the freedom to actually use uh, your time and energies to pursue your passions either individually or in common with others. And so what I'm trying to think about here is like how to update that for the 21st century, how to imagine post-scarcity in a way that, um, you know, we can present first as like a program of transition and then think about, you know, what we would do when that program is blocked by, for example, the threat of capital disinvestment. So there's a theory here of like the fight for change and of the ways that we might have to um, push for change in more drastic ways in order to get there. But the first thing would be to expand the provision, not just a basic income, but also of basic goods and services to create this kind of foundational economy that raises not just the standard of living for many people around the world, but actively makes it so that they don't have to work in order to live. The second thing we would have to do is reduce the work week and redistribute work. We'd also, of course, have to transform work. So today, most people only get up and go to work because they're afraid of not being able to make rent. It's possible though, by transforming the work process itself to make this work less onerous and even more enjoyable. Uh, so that one aspect of a post-scarcity world would have to involve people feeling useful and like the work they do is meaningful and satisfying. And also that it takes up less of their time and energy. The third thing we'd have to do, which is it's impossible to get one and two without the third one, is to socialize the investment process. And here I'm thinking of a eventually a kind of completely definancialized process of investment. I'd be happy to talk about that in more detail. But I'm imagining here a kind of uh, um, a kind of social and democratic version of uh, us deciding in common how we wanna use the resources we've set aside to change our world. What are the different uses that we wanna put these resources toward? How do we figure out you know, um, how much to devote towards building you know, dental clinics, food canteens and so on, and how much do we devote towards whatever it is that people in a post-scarcity society will want to find amusement and pursue their passions and, and so on. And the fourth thing we would have to do, of course, is democratize the institutions of society. And here I, I propose it that way because I'm thinking about how we don't want actually just to democratize uh, society as a whole and imagine that everything we need can be handled by a kind of endless plebiscite where everyone is involved in a kind of super uh, and fluid direct democracy. I do think the digital tools we have make it possible for people to make decisions and coordinate themselves in incredible new ways. And I think that's really the underemphasized dimension of technological change today. It's not that it uh, 
allows machines to make decisions for us, it actually makes it possible for us to make decisions with one another in ways that are more efficient and transparent than before. But the point I wanna make here is that um, the type of democratization we need is one that democratizes all of the various institutions of society. So, you know, places of work, uh, investment process in different sectors, um, you know, education and, you know, whatever other kinds of uh, institutions society has all have to be democratized sort of uniquely um, as a way to democratize society as a whole. So I, I have so much more to say about that, but um, I've now gone on for 40 minutes. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, take questions and hopefully there's enough material there that um, people uh, ha have some comments or questions that they'd like to raise. So thank you so much. Thanks so much um, Aaron, for that really compelling talk. And it definitely launched a lot of material for questions. So I see there's one or two questions already come in and I'll encourage people to um, yeah, use the chat box for any questions that you might have for Aaron. I'll be happy to read them to him. Um, so maybe I might start the discussion by launching a couple of questions uh, first, if that's okay. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is a kind of a technical point about your explanation of um, the sort of the causality behind uh, recent economic stagnation. So in your account, you lean a little bit on the, or develop the kind of the Brenner arguments of overcapacity. Um, and I just wanted to ask how you understand the relationship between overcapacity and overaccumulation. Um, they're seen as quite related, uh, but I kind of suspect that the reason why you stress overcapacity is because it allows for a kind of empirically verifiable analysis of recent developments mm. in capitalist history, whereas overaccumulation is something more stressed by kind of historians like Giovanni Arrighi and others who look at kind of laws of history or things that might be true in the long term but are more difficult to to um, to empirically verify. So I wonder, am I simplifying that, or how would you understand that relationship between uh, overaccumulation and overcapacity? A second question is more about how you understand the transformation of work. So your kind of critique um, doesn't kind of call for the end of work, for example, um, and breaks a little bit with certain on the far ultra left, let's say um, in the 20th century, say the situationists or Herbert Marcuse or others who talk about, you know, post-work, end of works type society. Um, you kind of stress, uh, as you kind of said towards the end, this transformation, which is not the same thing. And yeah, I'd just be just, Curious to hear your comments on your relationship to that other kind of tradition um, or how you differentiate from it. And then finally, um, just on this kind of post scarcity uh, tradition that you've constructed, that's really interesting. Um, something that really comes across in your recent writings on this is the question of um, ecological limits and desire. So, I mean, there's a couple of things I'm thinking of here. Like in France right now, for example, we've got the presidential candidate for the French Communist Party, the PC. Yeah, who's made a number of remarks about how he wants to represent the France who eats meat and who drives cars without being made to feel guilty and all this. And it's a kind of familiar type narrative that, you know, uh, those sort of ecologists who call for the recognition of limits are necessarily hysterians and so on. Mm. Um, and what you show with this post scarcity narrative is that there's a, a recognition of real ecological and social limits that nevertheless can go hand in hand with a kind of joyous surplus and that there's no human society or organization of society no matter how brutally constrained that doesn't have compulsions towards excess or towards certain forms of you know not irrational but yeah uh, excessive sort of gatherings so that makes me think a little bit of people like Georges Bataille and a certain kind of um, dissident French sociologists um, and you didn't, you've not really mentioned any of them in your kind of uh, post-scarcity tradition. So I'd just be curious, um, what other sort of intellectual sources, if people like Bataille or other sort of French anthropologists or sociologists or others might inform your thinking about this relationship between sort of um, excess social limits and uh, sort of post-scarcity thinking. Um, yeah, sorry, it's probably enough for to start things off. <laughs> great, well, those are three, I think, really great questions. Um, for the first one about overcapacity and overaccumulation, I think that, um, you know, I would say that I really think that Marxists should read more Keynes. And, you know, I think there's a long history of saying like, 
that, you know, talking about Keynes' limits, which, which are there are many. <laughs> and, you know, I think he's a very limited thinker, especially politically. And Jeff Mann wrote a really great book about that. Uh, in the long run, we're all dead. But I think that, you know, for me, reading Keynes really helps me distinguish between basically the real and the financial economy. And I think that there's, uh, there's a kind of way that, especially today, theorists of finance, you kind of see people wanting to speak as if like the financial economy is just completely lifted off from and differentiated itself from any reference to the real economy. And that's just absurd, honestly. Like there's just no empirical evidence for that. And I think, I don't know, we could talk about that in more detail, but it's precisely these things like slowing growth, rising turbulence, and even economic and financial crises that those accounts are unable to capture. But I think that basically the reason why I mention all that is because overcapacity and overaccumulation are really the same thing. They're just from different perspectives. So overcapacity is really stressing the, um, the side of it that's about the experience of firms on the ground recognizing that markets are overcrowded and hence it's irrational for them to invest more in expanding production. Like it, there's just no way that with a long-term view, they're actually gonna make good on major new investments in uh, plant and productivity in most of the world, you know? Um, and as a result, they're investing more incrementally not in like big, big changes. So that's what's happening on the ground. And the effect of that is that they are not reinvesting the profits they're earning. So you either have companies like Apple that is just sitting on a giant war chest. They have their retained earnings, like the amount of cash that the company has is just incredible. You know, that's in a way over accumulation from the firm side. But then the other thing that's happening is just massive share buybacks. So firms are just taking their earnings and they're just using them to buy their own shares. And as a way to pass the money back to the shareholders, part of the shareholder revolution. But it's really them saying, look, we don't know what to do with this money. So you just take it and you can do with it whatever you want. And so we have this kind of financialized side of the problem, the over accumulation side. The thing is that you have to see it as a symptom of what's going on in the real economy. And I, and I guess I should say, you know, in, in contrast to what I started saying, I think Keynes is actually sometimes pretty bad. Keynesians are pretty bad at thinking about those real economy trends. But I think that, um, you know, understanding that overcapacity, underinvestment, overaccumulation, these are all different, you know, secular stack, slow growth, those are all different sides of the same unfolding process. We're just looking at it from different angles. I think that, um, yeah, that's anyway, what, what, I, what I would try to get at in my work, I guess. Um, on the uh, relationship to post-work, I mean, that's been a very, you know, a, you, you hit on a key transition in my own thinking, because I was so in this post-work kind of camp that I think sometimes even more is like an anti-work position, right? That says that, um, you know, we should have as our goal to just drive down to an absolute minimum, the amount of work that we have to do, or maybe saying that the economy is already doing that. And, you know, I think that there's still a lot to be said for that. Like, I think that the, the things that the post-scarcity, uh, post the things that the post-work tradition really gets right are the way that it kind of doubts something that a lot of Marxists have said, which is sort of this communitarian impulse that people should find their sense of worth, their happiness through their contribution to the collective well-being through work. They should find their meaning and identity through work. And the post-work tradition really pushed back against that, I think crucially, um, to remind people of this kind of alternative tradition on the left, which is about work reduction, about life beyond work, and about um, enjoyment. I think part of it, it, there's two points for me. One is that I just don't see evidence that work is going away. And so I just think that overstressing the idea that we should be fighting for a world without work as such is just, you know, it's very disappointing kind of position. It's just not realizable in our lifetime. And so it's important to recognize that we can actually make work a lot better and that people do, when work is satisfying, people actually do, like when work is constructed in a certain way, it can be better. And I think part of the issue here is that a lot of post-work people sort of, insofar as they're interested in work becoming better, they adopt the work becomes play model. So it's an idea about getting beyond work through everything becoming enjoyable. And I think that that's wrong on two counts. I think one is that um, actually 
people don't only want to have fun all the time. They also want to like do things that are meaningful with their lives. And everybody, including the post worker people know that they are willing to do pretty drudgerous and repetitive tasks when they feel like those things are contributing towards the accumulation of their own knowledge of whatever it is they want to contribute. Drudgery is not a problem always and in itself. I mean, it'd be great if we could get rid of it more and more, but it's the, it's not, it's not that work has to become play. It's that, you know, there's all of these social scientific and psychological studies that show that the conditions people need to feel good about their work is not that it becomes play, but rather that they have a lot of autonomy in how they carry out the work, that um, they're really using skills that they've developed and that they feel the work has a real uh, true purpose, and that it benefits humanity, society, whatever. Um, and so I think that, you know, thinking about what it means to make work better is something that the post-work tradition has sort of fallen down on. And then the flip side is what people do with their free time. That's really what started me on my critical reflections around that, is that um, I really think it's important to recognize that in their free time, people won't only relax. I think it's silly to overemphasize this idea that, you know, what's beyond work is a world of enjoyment. I think what's beyond work is a world where people are doing all kinds of things that they're passionate about. And what you'll find is a lot of that passionate stuff involves a lot of drudgery you know like if you want to be really good at piano or guitar or if you want to be a philosopher you have to sit down and just spend a lot of time reading practicing repetitive tasks developing habits and that's just part of what it is and if you're doing it again in a free way none of those things really matter so much because they're part of you kind of like realizing yourself in the world so i just think that there's a kind of more open and expansive view we can have that's both more realistic and more exciting about and uh, about what um, the future might hold just briefly on the third question really great they mentioned the tide because i wrote an essay recently for the nation about anthropologists on work um, and 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 a post work future and I talked to, I was writing a review of this guy, James Sussman, and, and, and I, I had to decide because it was a popular text whether they talk more about Freud or about Bataille, and I went with Freud. But I think Bataille is an incredibly fascinating thinker. And I think the idea that societies have always had the problem of abundance, of actually producing an excess and thinking about what to do with it, is a really important way to turn around um, the idea of scarcity economics. And so it's definitely Bataille uh, and the theory of the cursed share had a big influence on me uh, that I should probably bring out more. I, I do think that, you know, obviously we need to work within ecological limits. I think part of the issue here, you know, I think there's problems with the degrowth perspective as well, but um, uh, which is that, you know, we should produce as much as we can within those limits, you know, of ecology. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to decline. But, or in the West, you know, I know they have a more complicated view about what happens in the global South. But I just would say that I think that um, uh, part of the issue here is really about what happiness is and what motivates people. And I think that Marxists, you know, productivists like in the PCF have just always overemphasized this productivist line that what people need is, um, you know, more and more goods and services, more and more access to stuff. And it's totally important that people have what they need to live, but there's just so much social scientific evidence that what people need is not just to meet their material needs, but also their spiritual needs. And to be a good materialist means to be able to think about um, those spiritual needs more, which are things that really conflict with the kind of Stalinist perspective, because there are things like personal autonomy, control over your life, you know, um, and yeah, anyway, one, one could go on about that, but uh, why don't we take some, some questions uh, from the floor? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. There's a lot of really interesting <laughs> questions coming in. So um, is it okay if I bundle together like two or three? Yeah, yep. definitely. So I'll just go from the top maybe um, from an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, hi, Aaron, would you be able to clarify how austerity programs constitute efforts to revitalize stagnant economies? My limited understanding is that such programs are implemented under the spurious motive of balancing the books and can also be considered an assault on the power of laboring classes However, did such efforts not inhibit private investment by reducing aggregate demand? Um, then a second question from Mazi uh, Zegavets um, asks, what are the implications of deindustrialization for the environment? 
Um, and Ryan Montgomery asks, would you be able to talk more about the idea of socializing investment, please? It would be really fascinating to hear more about how we might achieve that, particularly with digital tools. Um, maybe that's enough for the, the moment. Great. Yeah, I mean, I think that the first question really points out the criticisms that were made of austerity, uh, which are, I think, really important. You should just you know, note that from the perspective of these governments, austerity was a way to restore the conditions of growth. They thought that um, you know, there had been these big misalignments of you know, uh, incentives and misallocations of capital, and that in their view, um, austerity was going to pave the way towards better growth in the future. And it should be said that if you go to Germany, a country where I now mostly live, although I'm in the U.S. in the moment, uh, in Germany, they would tell you, look, we that succeeded. Like we did austerity. We, we did hard sphere. We pushed all these people to take jobs. We really held down real wage growth. And as a result, Germany was able to restore its competitive position in global markets. You know, of course, that ended up coming at the expense of all of these other countries in Europe um, and contributed a lot to um, not just the global financial crisis, but like what happened in the 2010s around Europe. But, you know, from the perspective of the economists in Germany, they would say austerity is a way to get to um, back to growth. And I think it's important to see that, um, you know, that's not it's not a position I support. I completely agree with the uh, criticisms that uh, you're raising there, but it was presented to governments as a way to get private actors back in the game. It's just been, as you say, very unsuccessful. And I think that's why today we're seeing more and more pushback against the narrative that austerity will get us back to growth. Uh, it's just important not to forget that that was its original rationale. Um, two, what are the implications of deindustrialization for the environment? Certainly, you know, um, Deindustrialization, if it meant uh, a reduction in the amount of goods produced would be good for the environment, assuming that, um, you know, probably true that producing less would be better uh, for the environment. Unfortunately, deindustrialization only means having fewer workers in industry. In, in total, it actually means producing more and more goods. It's just that the rate of expansion of output has slowed down. So um, deindustrialization has not been good for the environment because uh, it isn't associated with any decline in industrial production. And uh, that's a big problem. Um, you know, which isn't to say that we can't get to a world that is environmentally sustainable. It's just gonna not be something obviously that happens automatically uh, through an evolution of the capitalist system. It's gonna take dramatic social change in order to get there. And maybe, you know, that links to the, the third point about socializing investment, because I think one of the big things that we obviously have to do is uh, to dramatically change and redirect investment today to get us off of fossil fuels. And I'm obviously very uh, concerned that trying to do that through um, you know, private investment is just not gonna be successful. And I think that points the door towards something like socializing investment, having more public investment uh, or public led investment but you know, what I'm talking about is something radically more than what the Keynesians are promoting. I'm talking about something that would both socialize and democratize investments. So not just a technocratic program, but a, um, a more social one. And I guess that what I would say about that, and this is, it's a little bit of a difficult technical point, but what's important in the work I'm doing now is to see that, um, you know, one of the frameworks we have for thinking about human motivation, for thinking about happiness, and for thinking about um, econo economics is this framework that centers on the idea of optimization, that we need to optimize everything. And one of the things I point out is that optimization programs and algorithms, however you approach it, they have to take ultimately a single variable as their variable they're optimizing on. And of course, in a capitalist economy, it's efficiency. So we live in a world that's trying to use our resources, including labor, as efficiently as possible. Um, and of course, what everyone knows is that generates massive social costs because there are all of these other things that we care about. We care about um, something I've been talking about here, how satisfied workers are at work. We care about environmental sustainability. We care about, you know, um, 
yeah, I don't know, a whole range of other things, justice, you know, reparations for, you know, past uh, colonial uh, uh, and, and, and imperial rule and stuff. So when you take all those different criteria, they're not going to optimize at the same point. Like efficiency versus sustainability obviously would lead us in very different directions. And part of what socializing investment means is it involves recognizing that society has multiple goals. And then when we think about how to use our resources, there's no mathematical or technical uh, way to simply generate those outcomes, as it were, without human decision making involvement. So part of what socializing investment means is it means actually democratizing decisions about how we do our investment. And I don't think that would be for society as a whole. I think it would involve um, basically allocating a certain portion of our resources uh, to be set aside and then distributing them to um, groups, I call them in my current thinking, though it's not a very beautiful term, investment boards that are basically almost like mini uh, parliaments, like democratic bodies with, with people elected to them from the workers in that sector, from the users of the uh, output of that sector, and from different kinds of social uh, civic associations and community groups that are kind of deciding together um, where to go, you know, how to distribute the investment funds they have among the different workplaces in the field. So it's a distributed, partially decentralized uh, perspective. I'd have to say a lot more about it, but I have an article online called How to Make a Pencil, and there's another article coming out soon um, about socialist investment that has a little bit more detail about that. Uh, and yeah, I'd be happy to send those along if you email me. I got to speak more quickly. I got to no. say it last so we can answer more. <laughs> no worries, thanks. Um, so yeah, so Alison asks, um, how does the pandemic and potential outcomes of it affect your analysis, particularly the large numbers of voluntary job leavings and economic uh, growth? Um, and then Ryan Nolan asks, um, thanks for the talk, Aaron, super generative insights. I have a question, it might be a bit auxiliary uh, but to what you're discussing here, discussing here in your book, but thinking about post-scarcity, on the various quotes around pursuing the passions, etc. How do you envisage instruments of artificial scarcity, such as intellectual property laws, will factor in this new society? Uh, perhaps both in terms of the automation of cultural work, um, AIs writing articles or composing symphonies, and the moral rights for creators to protect their property. Um, thanks. I'll leave you with those two. Okay. Um, the pandemic outcomes one, you were saying it was which which aspect of it they were focused on? Um, I think they were kind of referring to um, the sort of the great, uh, what's it called? The great, oh, the voluntary job, job leaving. leaving. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Great, uh, important point. Yeah, I mean, I've been as fascinated as anyone else with the so-called great resignation. You know, there are doubts about how much it's happening and where and to what extent, but um, you know, for me, uh, I've really enjoyed reading like just people posting on that anti-work forum on Reddit and just seeing the kind of, I don't know, average people just kind of dealing, both both experiencing their power to not deal with um, their bosses and wondering about what it means in a kind of open way. I think that's a really important sign. I think we should take it as an indication of this kind of rare moment in which people really do have power in the, in, in the labor market. And we should remember that like in the fifties and sixties, this brief time we're experiencing now for like a year or so, that was the norm for the economy for decades in many countries in uh, the global North. And, you know, it's a very different world to imagine if that were the norm. What we're seeing in the context of today is that people are rejecting the worst abuses that they've been put under. And I think one thing I want to say about that is like, often you hear these stories about like, how wages have been stagnant for years, but wages being stagnant, that's just a symptom of a whole range of injustices that workers have been experiencing at work. Like to an incredible extent, I liked Elizabeth Anderson's essay on private government, sort of thinking about the political consequences of that. I guess the thing is, you know, and here I hate to be a downer, but I don't think it's going to last. I, I think that, um, you know, as a number of analysts have pointed out, it's really to do with the pandemic stimulus creating um, a temporary 
uh, reserves for people who, who've tended in the past not to have any reserves. And it's also about really wild supply shocks having to do with the pandemic. And so as things work themselves out, I think more and more um, we're going to return to the status quo ante, which is uh, persistently low demand for labor. Whether that will actually happen, um, you know, we'll see. But my bets are on a return to trend after a few years of kind of chaos. And that will make the period we're experiencing now a lot like, at least in the United States, the period 1995 to 2000, which is now, you know, over 20 years ago. That was the last time that workers in the United States had a temporary period of uh, labor market tightness. And just like today, they took advantage of it, but also just like today, I think it won't last um, super long. And that's why we need bigger changes in society. I, I am very amused, I'll just say that um, after you know, much talk about how the robots were taking over during the pandemic, you know, the evidence is coming in of the last two years that that just definitely didn't happen. So all the people who said that, that, that finally, yes, this thing that maybe it hadn't been happening now, it's gonna happen, they were um, proven wrong. As far as post-scarcity and intellectual property laws, I mean, you know, that question immediately makes me think of the NFT Web3 quote unquote revolution that's, that we're being bombarded with from all angles in the past few weeks. Um, and, you know, I think my, my idea is about a world that's kind of the opposite of the world that Web3 is promoting, because it's really about a world where people, um, where there's no longer ways that people earn incomes through ownership of assets. And uh, there's a lot of reasons to imagine that a world where that didn't happen would be a better world and that it would kind of drive innovation and, um, you know, social change in a broader sense. I think that I, here I'm thinking a lot about John Dewey. He had this really incredible line that I think people don't think about enough. He says, the thing about capitalism is that it pushes us to think about innovation only in terms of business innovation. It's like the things people can make money from are the things that ultimately receive resources and gain support. And you know, in a world where people are trying to earn additional income through ownership of assets, whether they're intellectual or physical property, um, that's where that pushes. Whereas you know, there's a possibility for a world that provides people with resources to do what they want, whether those things are intellectual, artistic, cultural, religious, you know, whatever realms of life that people are innovating in all the time and often without resources. So I wanna to get to a world where, um, where everybody is, a, and it's complicated to explain how it works, but it's an important part of the post-scarcity vision is that everyone has access to the resources they need to pursue their passions individually or uh, collectively or in associations. Um, and those that that frees them to kind of engage in this innovative activity across all of the realms of social life, rather than innovative activity being pushed into um, the business world. Okay, what else we got? Okay, so I'm going to go with a question from Daria that um, uh, she asks: How to how do you evaluate the alternative arguments of Jason Smith more directly based on, on value theory? So I think Darius referring to the, um, the book from Jason E. Smith published by Reaction on um, service work and automation. Um, and then AJ Gudarti asks, how does post-scarcity relate to the question of social exclusion? For instance, issues related to race and gender, surely they can survive. And if they do, how will issues of dignity and recognition get shaped? Um, moral psychology seems to be autonomous of material changes. Um, mm -hmm. Nikos Karfakis uh, says, thank you. What is your take on the philosophical anthropology arguments that work is a defining characteristic of humans? That work is or isn't? It is. Uh, kind of it is. Yeah. Um, okay. So on Jason Smith's book, I mean, look, it's really interesting. And I think the effort kind of makes sense of these uh, trends from within a kind of... Um, yeah, Marxist value theoretic perspective is super fascinating. And I think that in general, you know, Marxism as a perspective has been hugely influential on me, obviously. And uh, yeah, and I, and I think it's a very interesting way to look at the world. I think we'd have to, we'd have to try to tease out what empirically, um, how the accounts differ and then like what the, what the, what they, what they would, what, what, 
the world would look like that would agree with that theoretical perspective. So as someone who's trained more as a historian uh, and you know, an empirical social scientist, I guess I'm more interested in not just how we can interpret the world, but like how that interpretation actually changes what we think about the world. Um, so yeah, I would have to think more about what specifically that interpretation gives us in terms of um, an insight into uh, the present moment. I will say, you know, that in general, I'm very skeptical of um, the distinctions between productive and unproductive labor that come from the Marxist tradition of, you know, any efforts to like read, though this isn't what Jason's doing, like the labor theory of value uh, back into what Marx was writing and, and generally of like organic composition of capital type arguments, which I think are just really empirically inaccurate about the causes and trends of um, capitalist crisis. But that's a talk for another time. Uh, on racial and gender exclusion, that's a really important question. And my view now is that um, it's really important to recognize that racial and gender um, domination, let's say, very will persist basically after the end of capitalism that eradicating those um, experiences of domination they they will be they will be facilitated by the transition of post scarcity but that transition is not enough to achieve that outcome um, and for me you know I think of that uh, partially I guess what I want to say is I think the 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 tradition I come out of this kind of socialist, communist, anarchist, you know, this kind of tradition of thought has, has far too much depended on this idea that what comes after capitalism is of the reign of social harmony and the end of conflict and the end of structured conflict. I just think that that view that sort of sees um, the end of capitalism is the end of politics. I now think that that is incredibly misguided. And I think it really affects how we think about these issues, which we will have to tackle, you know, specifically, um, not just in the fight to end capitalism, but also after it's over. And I'll just say that um, I've been thinking a lot about reparations as a general framework for thinking about these issues. And I think reparations is generally taken in contemporary society the wrong way because it's usually thought of as a monetary term and it's about giving people money. So it has almost like the same thought world as basic income. It says like the response to past injustice is a monetary equivalent. And I just think that that's wrong. What matters is real wealth, which is actually the um, contained in the kind of built environment that we have around us uh, that shapes what's possible for us to do. So for me, you know, reparations here means investment in real sense, like turning our resources towards, um, you know, repairing, like in the, obviously you can never fully make good on the history and legacy of colonialism and imperialism, but we have to devote massive shares of the world's resources towards developing, you know, underdeveloped like uh, areas of the world. And that's true not only across the world, but in many of the global North countries, there's huge areas that have just not seen uh, the development of resources that people need for their lives. That has to be repaired and fighting those things means fighting um, racial domination in the post-scarcity context. It also means massive investments in, you know, childcare and all kinds of other changes that would need to be made to be reparative um, uh, with regard to gender uh, domination. And I, I would even extend the concept to like forms of work that haven't seen research and development to make them less drudgerous. So for example, I think we need reparations for cleaning, reparations for, you know, for all kinds of dangerous work that has been uh, disregarded by research and development in the course of the 20th century. So that's sort of my framework for thinking about that. One, yes, conflict persists. Other forms of domination will need specific struggles to take place to overcome them. And that reparations is for me, the kind of generic framework in which I'm starting to think about that. Is work a defining aspect of what it means to be human? I think that what it is to be human is an open question. And that the thing that's awesome about human beings is that, you know, like Rousseau said to quote a French thinker, you know, human being, human being is historical and social and it changes over time. So whether work was, you know, in the past, what it meant to be a human being doesn't necessarily tell us what our future is. Um, I think that work will continue to be a big part of what people want and need and that, 
you know, you don't need a philosophical anthropology uh, that's like permanent and fixed to recognize that at least people today actually want to feel useful. And that feeling useful is a really important part of being happy, feeling like you have skills and capacities that, um, that, you know, that you can give as a gift to like people you love or to your community or to society. I think those are very meaningful parts of human life um, that, yeah, any post-scarcity society where people are able to actually express their needs um, would show that that is a need that people currently have. Whether it continues to be far into the future is an open question. Okay. I'm going to skip down a little bit further in the threads to... Um two comments from an anonymous attendee and then from Yusuf Nishat Patero. So an anonymous attendee asks, uh, thanks for the talk, two questions. What's your current thinking about how those four post-scarcity measures should be pursued? And two, what's your thoughts on how to deal with the threats of disinvestments? And then uh, Yusuf comments, uh, in your recent work, you've drawn on Otto Neurath's and John O'Neill's writings on associational socialism for questions about the democratization of institutions. How do you see this in relation to socialist Republican political theories of popular participation and collective freedom? And how do you see the fit of the latter with your vision of post-scarcity? Could you just, um, the first one, I forgot to write it down. Could you just summarize it for me again? Yeah, no problem. So it's just above Yusuf's comment. It was um, just two questions about what's your current thinking about how the four post-scarcity measures should be pursued? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on uh, on how to deal with the threat of disinvestment, right? Uh, okay, so I'll answer that one first. These are all, you know, <laughs> everyone's asking really great questions, and that's wonderful. Um, and I, I can't do them justice at all. I mean, I feel like that that question is really a question about strategy, right? Like, how do we get there? And you know, one thing I always say to people, although it depends on what country you're in, what your experience of it is today is like, we live in a time, the reason why I'm writing about this is because we're living in a time of rising social struggles. I mean, it's not just me or EndNotes who says that, it's like the IMF, you know, all of these global institutions are tracking the rise in social unrest across the world. And that should be the, 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 the kind of framework in which we think about strategies for change. You know, my view at the moment is that like, we should elaborate a program of change that does not require, um, you know, like uh, it doesn't require, I don't know what word to use as a euphemism for like, you know, revolution, but we should lay out a program of kind of gradual change of what it is that we would wanna do to get to this post-scarcity world. And then we should have secondarily reflect on the way that the threat of disinvestment makes it very difficult to imagine a gradual transition to post-scarcity. And so I think we should lay out a kind of general program and we should promote that within the struggles happening today, within political movements and so on, like any of these aspects of change that are possible. And I look to all of these different trends, fights for a four day week, for you know, green new deals or green investment for um, you know basic income or basic services even more, you know for all these different public and all that stuff are possible transition vehicles. But then we have to recognize that it's very unlikely that that any of this will actually succeed without a really intense confrontation with um, that with the power of capital through the capital strike and threat of disinvestment. So it's this two sided approach. Um, I'm really into Republican theories. I think the emphasis on freedom there is really important. Reading uh, William Clare Roberts' book, Marx's Inferno, was a really important turning point for me and led me to read the kind of English, um, you know, theorists that, that like Owen and the Owenites that Marx and Engels were drawing on. I think that book underemphasizes the French tradition of communist thinking in the 1840s like the French Republican tradition, the Rousseauian tradition that comes out of like Babeuf, but then especially um, Etienne Cabet and the 1840s French communists. So I'm sort of, I see these things as moving relatedly. Like if you read Cabet, Cabet is trying to unite Rousseauian Republicanism and Thomas More type post-scarcity thinking in his 
Travels in Icaria book. Um, but yeah, I think I think the Republican stuff is really important. I think sometimes to me, the Republican tradition, at least the kind of English derived version of it, tends to emphasize negative freedom and constitutionalism as a perspective. Whereas what I'm talking about is much more, not about like a, a constitution, but a kind of dynamic view of how a society changes over time. And I'm not sure if I'd like to investigate more, whether there's a conflict between sort of this neo-Republican social, social Republican theory on the one hand, and the kind of very Rathian O'Neill version of a kind of pluralist associational vision on the other. I'm kind of wondering how those uh, relate and conflict. If you have any ideas about that, please uh, feel free to write me an email. I'm, I'm very much interested in that and I'm not an expert in it. Hey, um, Martin O'Shockensee uh, writes, Aaron, is there a tension in your arguments between what might seem to be state-driven initiatives and something more participatory and deeply democratic? Uh, the latter perhaps connecting more to an anarchist tradition. So let's leave you with that. Yeah. Oh, I'm so, I'm like, I'm just trying to walk my way back from anarchism very slowly because that's been a huge influence on my thinking for a really long time. I, I'm just not, I don't know, I've never been very interested in state-driven approaches. And I guess that I think that like in the contemporary moment of Keynesian revival, I'm very scared of the ways that people have this very top-down bureaucratic and technocratic vision of social change. And I'm sort of surprised and horrified by the way that they, that the pr people promoting that vision have not really thought about the democratic deficits of the earlier period of Keynesianism. Like they just seem to not really have that much interest or impulse to think through like what went wrong in the earlier era and why um, technocracy doesn't end up delivering. Uh, what it proposes. So I'm not, yeah, I would say, you know, there's a tension between recognizing that part of what's happening today is political, not just anti-political, not just in the streets, and thinking about what that means for visions of transformation, and the goal, which is a deeply democratic vision in which, um, yeah, it's not a, a, a state-centric vision. And anyway, I think I think there's a lot of really interesting thought about what comes after elite politics, representation, you know, both representational uh, democracy, elite democracy, and um, bureaucratic society. I think that, you know, and, and I, I guess I wonder, I think it would be good for people who are influenced by the anarchist tradition to think more about people outside of that tradition um, who are trying to think about what these forms of, I don't know what you want to call it, governance or handling conflict would look like. Like, I don't know that much stuff by anarchists interrelating with this new trend of thinking about like sortition, mini publics, like all of these ideas about forms of democratic uh, governance that are not based on representational democracy. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm also very interested in the participatory stuff and the new book I'm writing is just really, a lot about that. So sorry, I can't say more about it right now. Thanks. Um, we're almost out of questions. So maybe to conclude, I might ask one final question, if that's okay. It yeah. kind of, uh, tags on to Martin's point, but just, um, you know, in your writing, sometimes you've kind of emphasized uh, um, the sort of the problems of certain forms of idealism, which uh, propose sort of political programs attached of uh, proximity to social movements and so on and yeah you make this obviously materialist critique in a lot of your work but at the same time and um, you make quite a lot of propositions that might be seen by some materialists as um, audacious in a sense uh, whether you want to take mm. that in a positive or a critically cautious sense so I'm just really interested in that that's a kind of a tension as well in your work I think and um, that I'd like to hear you say more about this kind of relationship of thought or of theory to actually existing kind of social movements and you know the fact that as you said in the book you don't kind of limit yourself to critique there's also a lot of kind of a speculation on what the future might look like so the kind of methodological challenges that that sort of brings to your work yeah that's a really um that's a good opportunity for me to kind of talk about my evolving views on that um i wrote an article 
about critical theory and communism that sort of summarized a lot of the EndNotes program a few years ago that, uh, that said, you know, that there's three tasks for the future. One is to like keep um, uh, analyzing like the crises that are unfolding in, in our kind of decrepit society and to kind of trace the ways that they're like um, dividing people and producing conflicts that are occurring, you know, uh, uh, yeah, in all these different ways in society. The second one was to like analyze the struggles that people are engaging in the ways that those struggles always project kind of positive moment of overcoming of division, the ideal moment of struggles to analyze those struggles, to analyze the ways that they're productive of new ideas and visions um, and without becoming the cheerleaders of those struggles. Uh, that's the second one. And the third one was to begin to promote, you know, a vision of the future, like overcoming of capitalism, what that actually looks like in a positive way. And that's the third one is what I've really turned to uh, in my recent work. I think that, you know, critique is important. Critique is very important. Like we live in a bad society and understanding why. And as it were thinking about critique, you know, in my view is best when it's thought of as a justification or the reason giving of struggle, you know, to think of critique in relationship to why, to explain why people are struggling. I think that's really important rather than, than to have an abstract critical perspective that sort of removes itself from, um, from trying to explain struggle as it's happening. Uh, but I think that like we now live in a time, I'm placing my bets that we live in a world of growing social unrest and that that will continue into the future. And that what that means is that it's time to really push beyond critique, which I think was a defensive move of an era in which struggles seem to not be um, taking off. It was a kind of hibernating mode for uh, the traditions that, that I think of myself as a part of, that we're a part of, and that you know now is the time to begin to think in a positive mode. And it's really important to recognize that the movements that people think of themselves as a part of, like the anarchist tradition, socialist communist tradition, think of the words that they use to describe those things. It's not called the anti-capitalist tradition for a reason, because it was never a negative project. It was never a purely critical project. It was only inspiring as a project of social transformation and the movements are named after their vision of the future to come much more often than they're named for what they oppose and that's that's just if you just dwell on that and think about it you really see that you know in a time of rising social unrest our role as theorists which is totally limited you know like <laughs> individuals play are drops in the bucket when it comes to um long unfolding uh, waves of social and historical, you know, history itself. So we only have a limited role to play, but within that, we should recognize that we need to increasingly turn ourselves towards a positive account of the future. The book I'm writing now is going to try to lay out a very different account of what the components of that future might be than the existing ones, which I think are as fascinating as they are, are just incredibly limited in terms of the future that they're imagining, like the existing models of a post-capitalist economy. Uh, and, and I don't think I have the answers by any means. It's, it's a very humble project in a certain way, but I'm hoping that by putting a bunch of hypotheses on the table and laying out possible positions to contribute to a debate, and I see more and more people interested in that debate, interested in talking about what the future will look like. Not, not like no one's Robert Owen. No one's going to show up like I have a blueprint for how we lay out the future. That's insane. No one should do that. We're not building blueprints to the future, but we're trying to develop and inspire this conversation that hopefully is part of a conversation that I mean necessarily is happening as much in struggles as in society as, as a whole about what comes next. And the bigger the struggles are, the more inspiring those visions of the future, I think will be able to be. So it's a very, um, it's a very tactical position, even though it seems very idealistic. It's very tactical and located in our moment. At least I hope, that's my claim. That seems like a fitting note to end on. Um, so thanks so much, uh, Aaron, and thanks very much to everyone for uh, all your comments and questions. Uh, just before we wrap up, just to draw your attention to the fact that the next events in this series will take place on the 18th of March, 
It's a talk by Brenna Banzer that will explore the um, conceptual and historical analogies between warfare and private property law. Um, so you'll find details about that published on our website early next week. And um, we've also got a number of on-site events taking place at ULIP in the near future. So please have a look at those as well on the events section of our website. Um, yeah, I guess that's all for today. So thanks again so much, Aaron, and to everyone for uh, tuning in. Thank you so much. Great, great conversation. So thanks for all the questions too.